Hello. Our lesson that we're going to work on today is going to be Introduction to Electronic Fetal Monitoring. This is just an introduction, and really the student population that this is going to be most interesting to will be the nursing student that is trying to get um, just a basic knowledge of how the fetal monitor works and to be able to answer some of the questions that pop up on um, the standardized testing and clicks testing, and then possibly even the new nurse that has just been hired into um, labor and delivery and may want to uh, uh, get an idea of what's happening with that electronic fetal monitor before they take um, their training courses to become certified in this area. This is one of the areas that um, labor and delivery nurses do actually have certifications and um, AWAN Association of Women's Health, Obstetric Neonatal Nurses, our professional organization offers a certica certification and there's also a certification that you can do through um, NCC, which is um, National Certifying Corporation. Okay, so let's get started. When we're talking about the fetal monitor, we're talking about um, a monitor that will uh, go outside of the body. The, that's one we're going to focus on today. There are some internal monitors as well, but this is the we're looking at outside the body, and it's going to interpret what's happening in the womb. The display um, will actually be reco recorded here in um, real time, and then there'll be a paper that is um, recording both the fetal heart rate and the contraction. Um, activity. Most of the time this is also electronic and um, most uh, some places don't even record on paper anymore. That'll be facility specific. So electronic, uh, continuous electronic fetal monitoring uses a machine. It produces a continuous tracing of that heart rate. Um, there uses a graphic record. It is a legal record. So a lot of times patients will ask to take that home and um, it has to go into the, if it's being recorded, it needs to go into the medical record. And our evidence-based practice really says that if mom is low risk, that we can be doing intermittent fetal monitoring rather than continuous. In fact, interestingly enough, we have seen uh, the use of continuous electronic fetal monitoring over the last uh, 30 years or so, but we've not seen any significant changes in our babies um, that uh, come out and have uh, issues with seizures and or which is or a cerebral palsy which is what we commonly associate as being um, from a birth injury so interestingly enough our very broad use of this monitoring has not decreased our uh, morbidity for our babies so if a mom is low risk we do uh, there's uh, that would be another video another um, a uh, way of looking at it, or another tool that you would learn to do intermittent fetal monitoring. So our primary objective for using this would be to provide information about fetal oxy oxygenation and hopefully prevent fetal injury from impaired oxygenation and to detect those heart rate changes before they become prolonged and profound. The first action that we would do would be using some Leopold's maneuvers to determine the position of the fetus, and that will help us to determine where to put the monitor. So this is just a graphic representation of what this baby looks like inside this mom. And um, we start by trying to determine if the baby is head down or bottom down, called breech. And then we try to determine what side the baby's back is on. You can also ask the mom, where do you feel most of the kicking? And if the mother feels most of the kicking in this area, then we know that by placing the fetal monitor here, we will um, pick up that baby's heart rate. The monitor actually looks through the abdomen. Um, and so even if the baby is not in this perfect position, you should be able to catch those heart tones. And for a baby that's head down, it's usually down below this area that we will find those heart tones. And for a baby that's breech, we may actually find them a little bit higher. So this is an example of one of the types of straps that we can use. This um, top monitor is the one that's going to rest just on the top of the uterus, what we call the fundus, in order to be able to pick up movement. This does not tell us how strong those contractions are. It merely tells us how often they're happening and how long they're lasting. This one down here is our ultrasound, 
And this is where we're going to place ultrasonic gel and then pick up our fetal heart tones. You can see that there's an extra cord going around this mom. And sometimes these have to be um, twisted in or, or, or bent in just enough to catch that heart rate. And we can use a, a tool like this in order to get just the right angle. Sometimes you'll see washcloths. There are many different types of straps, belly bands that are on the market. Again, that will depend on your facility. So now moving on to the display, when we're looking at the paper, uh, the top is going to be what is recording the uh, fetus, and the bottom is going to be what's recording the, any uterine activity. These big red lines, this represents one minute, so each of these little boxes would be 10, so 10 seconds, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So here's your minute. When you're looking this direction, it's the same idea. Each of these boxes represent 10 going this direction. So you've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So that would be one minute in between those red lines. Um, now looking at the display a little bit differently is as you're going up the scale, these are tens, and you can see the scale over here, 60, 70, 80, 90. But on the bottom where we're seeing the uterine activity, we go by fives. So 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. And here's just another representation of um, becoming familiar with those values where I've drawn it all out. Uh, makes it a little bit easier to see. You can pause the video here and spend a minute a minute looking at this. The next thing we're going to talk about is the timing of the uterine contractions. To determine frequency, how often the contractions are happening, we're going to count from the beginning of one to the beginning of the next one. So again, these are one minute, and so we have one, two minutes in between these two contractions. And so, um, and then let's do the next one. If we're gonna start here, one, two. So these contractions are happening at about two minutes apart. And now duration is how long that individual contraction is lasting. So we would measure from the beginning of one to the end of that same one to do duration. So remember these are counting by tens when we're going in, the, uh, in this direction. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 seconds is how long this contraction is lasting. How long is this one lasting? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 seconds. So duration and frequency, something that you would want to be, uh, want to know how to document. A little tip is if we're having contractions that are, we're having more than five in a 10 minute strip, that's averaged over 30 minutes, or if we're having two uterine contractions that are lasting more than 120 seconds, we call that tachysystole, uterine tachysystole, and it does require nurse intervention. We know that um, when the uterus is contracting, the baby is not um, getting full blood flow during that time that there's all that compression and contraction happening in the uterus. And um, if we have more than five in 10 minutes, uh, averaged over 30 minutes or more than 120 seconds long, the baby's not going to have enough of a recovery time in between. So some interventions uh, we will talk about a little bit later in, in this video. Here's an example of what uterine um, hyperstimulation or the, hyperstimulation is the old word. Now we call it um, tachysystole. Uh, this is what it would look like. So here you have a strip of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is seven and a half minutes long on the screen here. And you already have one, two, three, four, five. So any more contractions, which you looks like she is having, would um, require uh, nurse intervention. So when we're talking about our beginning fetal monitor interpretation, we are using the NICHD nomenclature. So that's the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And the reason why we use the same terminology is so that everyone's on the same page. When I call a physician or a midwife and I'm, I'm using this terminology, they know exactly what I mean because certain criteria is what allows us to call it certain things. And, and you'll understand more as we continue on. Um, so here are some steps that we're going to use in order to develop our NICHD um, nomenclature. 
The first thing we're going to do is we're going to determine what our baseline fetal heart rate is, and then we're going to determine what the fetal heart rate variability is. Um, we're ask ourselves, are heart rate accelerations present? And then are heart rate decelerations present? If yes, which variety are they? And then we're going to, to determine which category we're in and is intervention necessary. So let's begin. So here we're looking at our normal baseline fetal heart rate, normal values 110 to 160. And here is our, our baby up at the top. 110 is here, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160. So this is the range that the baby can be in for it to be normal range. If it's under 110, we call that bradycardia. If it's over 160, we call that fetal tachycardia. So when you are determining what the baseline is, you need a 20 minute strip. So 20 minutes on that monitor to determine that baseline. And then we're going to draw an imaginary line where that, ba where that baby's heart rate falls most often. So if I drew an imaginary line through here, I would say that this baby is in the 135 range. And um, you don't count if they're, when you're looking at baseline, you don't count any accelerations or any decelerations. The next slide explains that a little bit better. We'll get there in just a minute. When, what is the fetal heart rate variability? So now when I'm talking about variability, I'm talking about that beat to beat change in that, in that box. So we know our, our boxes represent 10 seconds. So when I'm looking at this variability, this is absent. There's no changes. And in order to be absent, it basically is, is almost like drawing a straight line, no changes. When I'm discussing minimal variability, that's zero to five beats of change. So that means that the heart rate does not change more than zero to five beats within that box. When I'm discussing moderate variability, my range is six to 25. So that means that my, my baby's heart rate is going to change at least half a box and sometimes as much as two and a half boxes in, in um, variability. And when I'm talking about marked, it's greater than 25 beats. So here again is my box. This is um, uh, 10 here. This is 10 here. And more than 25, greater than 25 beats of change is going to represent marked. Each one of these are described at the top of the screen here. And so you can take a minute and take a little look. I'm gonna go through what each one of them looks like again. So here we are with um, minimal variability and you can see I'm looking at this baby's heart rate and there's this um, area that's been marked out on the screen for you. And it's less than five beats of change. So if that box is 10, it's moving less than half of that box away from each other. So variability is a very important factor to be able to master, and I will be discussing what that means here in just a minute. So here I'm looking at minimal variability, and again, you're going to look at the little boxes that have been um, marked out for you on the screen. Here you go. And so this baby's heart rate is changing more than 6 to 25 beats uh, uh, of change. So you can see how they look a little bit different. I'm going to go back to this screen for just a minute. See how these look different? It's significant because when we are talking about variability, we're talking about how well that baby is oxygenating. Variability and oxygenation are very closely tied together. So again, minimal variability, moderate variability. We're gonna move on here. Here's absent variability. Remember I said it looks like you're drawing a straight line. This is an ominous sign. We should not have absent variability in our babies. That's no detectable vari variation around that baseline. And here's marked, here's a better picture of marked. So you see this baby has lots of variability away from its baseline. Um, and so that's more, greater than 25 beats of variation. Our next step is our accelerations present. Accelerations are 15 beats above the baseline for at least 15 seconds. So there's one, there's one, there's one. Accelerations are a good thing. We like that. Accelerations tell us that this baby has reserve and is oxygenating well. Here is another um, representation of that acceleration above that baseline. Again, 
a 15 beats above the baseline for at least 15 seconds. Now we ask ourselves, are decelerations present? There's a couple of different kinds of decelerations. A variable deceleration is below the baseline for 15 beats. And so here you see a variable. They often look, they often have this V shape. So that will help you determine if that's a variable or not. It should be down by 15 for more than 15 seconds. And it's not always associated with um, a uterine contraction. You see, there's no association with the contraction there. The next one is an early. An early deceleration occurs at the same time as that uterine contraction. So this contraction is happening and this deceleration is happening at exactly the same time. So they mirror each other. A late deceleration is going to start after the contraction has started. And usually after the peak of the contraction, you'll start to see this baby's heart rate drop. A late deceleration happens after the, the contraction has started. A prolonged is a deceleration that goes down and stays down for more than two minutes. We're gonna discuss each one of these at length. So a variable deceleration, again, it may or may not be associated with a contraction. We're looking at 15 by 15, um, uh, but not more than two minutes. And the, it, it, it can be associated with contraction or it may not be. Early deceleration, so this one's not as pronounced as the earlier example, but here you see this early is mirroring what's happening here with this contraction. Here's another early. It's happening at the same time. Sometimes we'll even hold a piece of paper up to see, to the screen, to see when exactly is that um, deceleration happening. Here's a late deceleration. Notice what kind of variability do we have here? This is absent. Absent variability and late decelerations. Here's the peak of the contraction, and here's that deceleration that is after the peak of the contraction. And a prolonged, you can see it comes down, it stays down for more than two minutes and then slowly starts to come back up. So now let's discuss what each one of these actually mean. So there's a wonderful mnemonic that has been created. Um, I can't take credit for it. I, it's been around for a long time. I'm not exactly sure who was the original author of this mnemonic, but it's called veal chop. And so you can always remember this by writing the word veal, and then writing the word chop on the other side. So variables are, are variable um, decelerations are related to cord compression. This is our baby's cord that's being compressed. It could be that it's being compressed, the head's pressing on it, maybe the baby's body's laying on it, maybe the baby's even reaching out and squeezing it. But cord compression is what causes those variable decelerations. An early deceleration, this is the deceleration that mirrors the contraction, is caused by head compression. As the baby moves through that pelvis, it will start to show some head compression and, and or, or will show some early decels in relationship to the head compression. Oftentimes when the cervix is completely gone, sometimes those earlies will go away. An acceleration, we say is A-OK, -okay, or the baby's oxygenated. So everyone's good with an acceleration. Accelerations are a good thing. Lates mean there's placental insufficiency. And you could also say that this baby is not getting what they need. There's no reserve. So a late is an ominous sign. So let's go back through them. A variable deceleration, not necessarily an issue unless it's repetitive. More than 50% of the time, then we're starting to be concerned what's going on with that cord. Uh, early deceleration is head compression. This is benign. We don't have to be concerned about head compression. This baby's coming down and through the pelvis. As long as we continue to have good variability, we are not concerned. Accelerations are good. That means the baby's oxygenating. Lates, not good. So I always say you can be early to dinner, but you can never be late. It's another way of help letting me remember which ones are okay and which ones are not. So a late deceleration, that's associated with uh, the beginning of the deceleration happening after that contraction, and it's um, related to placental insufficiency. 
So now we're going to determine what category our baby is in. When we're looking at, we have three categories, category one, two, and three. When we're looking at these categories, they have certain criteria. So in order for my category, my baby to be in category one, which is good, everybody's happy with a category one, the baseline must be a normal range, 110 to 160. The variability must be moderate. Late or variable D cells um, must be absent. Early decelerations must be present or absent. It's or they can be either present or absent. And accelerations can be present or absent. Now we'd like uh, to see it, accelerations. Um, if the baby's not taking a nap, sometimes when they're taking a nap, we don't see as many accelerations, but we should see some accelerations at some point in that strip. So in order for them to be category one, pretty much everything has to be perfect. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about category three before I do category two. So category three is when there's intervention needed. So this is our baseline range, 110 to 160, or it could be bradycardic or tachycardic. Remember, bradycardia is under 110 tachycardic is over 160. The baseline variability will be absent, and there could be late or variable decelerations or recurrent variable or recurrent lates. So if we have more than two of these um, items, we need to be looking at immediate intervention. And I'll talk a little bit about uterine resuscitation in just a minute, but if we have a category three, we don't just sit and document that. It is our job to make sure that we um, are intervening and trying to help that baby and um, expedite delivery, whatever that means. If she's um, close to delivery and there is a, a provider that can provide some intervention to help that baby come right away, or if she needs to go to an operating room and expedite that delivery. We do not want this category three to carry on for um, any period of time. Now I'm gonna go to category two. Category two is caution. And so you see the colors I put here. Uh, category one is green, category two is yellow, category three is red. So category two is caution, and there's um, a category two that is a good category two, and then there's a category two that's more of an ominous category two. So you kind of have to, you'll get some experience over time trying to determine where you are. But if you're category two, your baseline range, you may have tachycardia or bradycardia, but you still have to have at least minimal variability. Because if you have absent variability, you're moving into category three. Your baseline um, can be minimal or absent, but you can't have any decelerations if that's uh, going on. You can have late or variable decelerations, and they can be recurrent, but we should still have minimal or moderate variability. It's still okay to have a category two if we have a prolonged more than two minutes, but not more than 10 minutes. Early decelerations can be absent or present, and um, accelerations can be absent or present. As we continue on, this is going to start making more sense. So here's a visual representation. Here we have moderate variability. Um, we have a, a baseline that's a normal range. This baby, category one. Here, we're starting to have minimal variability with some variable D cells. This is caution, we're just gonna continue watching category two. Here, we have absent variability with a late deceleration. Category three, we need to do some intervention. And here's another representation of your um, categories. And it's usually written in the Roman numerals, so category one, category two. One is considered normal, category two is indeterminate. You don't really know what's going on, and category three is abnormal. Here's what we would do for those. If we have a category one, we would continue monitoring. Everybody's happy with category one. In fact, if she's been category one and she's in the low risk, we might even consider um, with an order from our provider or following the, the facility policy is taking her off those monitors for a while. If she's category one, no one is no one's worried about that baby. Category two, we're going to consider discontinuing any um, Pitocin if that's what's good, if, if we're utilizing that. We can consider um, the need to expedite delivery if symptoms persist or worsen. And then category three, you will can discontinue oxytocin and expedite delivery either with an operative vaginal or a cesarean delivery. 
here's another representation of how to time those contractions. This is just a good um, picture that reminds you, you when you are timing uh, how frequent the contractions are happening. It's from the beginning of one to the beginning of the next. And when you are timing how uh, long the contraction is lasting, it's from the beginning of one contraction to the end of that same contraction. And just a reminder, one of the best ways to actually feel how strong those contractions are, are A, ask the patient, and B, just place your hand on the top of the fundus, uh, the palm of your hand on the top of the fundus, and actually measure with your hand the strength of that contraction. And you will be measuring either um, soft, moderate, or firm. So uterine resuscitation, this is a standard in most places, and when we're talking about the NICHD terminology, um, I, uh, usually there's an IV fluid bolus with some sort of um, uh, uh, solution. Sometimes uh, normal saline I have seen it used, but for the most part it's usually um, uh, LR, lactated ringers. 500 mLs rapidly, so not over, not on a pump, because that's going to take a, uh, at least an hour to get in. Um, or in order to get the volume that we need to get in, it's going to take quite some time to set it on the pump, um, meaning the pump can't put it in as fast as you need it to. So most places will use a pressure bag, and that's just a bag that goes over the IV bag and pumps up with some pressure. This volume amount, 500 is what the evidence is telling us makes a difference. Sometimes you'll see in facilities, they ask for different amounts, um, 300, and that will be up to uh, each facility and their policy. And then we want maternal position change, left lateral if we can, right lateral, hands and knees, hips open with the use of a peanut ball, sometimes high fowlers will help change um, what's going on with the baby, even knees together if the baby's uh, coming on in the outlet uh, through the pelvis and that's causing a lot of early decelerations. We can sometimes change that by just having the mom change her position. We're going to apply O2, 10 liters, by a non-rebreather face mask. Um, we don't use anything lower than that. And then if we are doing uterine resuscitation, we should be turning any Pitocin off and making sure that we are documenting that. Here are the references that I've used to put this together. And if you are looking for more practice, there's actually a couple of places online that you can go. This uh, NCC offers a free game where you can go through some of the strips and um, determine um, all the things that we just did. So this is a, a great little um, uh, extra practice for you. We're actually going to do some practice strips together now. So I'm going to let you pause the video and you're going to answer all of the questions that are down here below. And now we're going to move on to the answers. So here we looked at our baseline. Remember, you're going to draw a line where it is most often not in between contractions. And, I mean, sorry, not in between um, acceleration. Let me try that one more time. Not when an acceleration is happening and not when a deceleration is happen happening. So I came up with 145 here. Is that in our normal range? It is. 110 to 160 is our normal range. Variability, it's more than six beats of change. So six to 25 puts us in the moderate range. Are accelerations present? Yes, I see one here, 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 here. Are decelerations present? I don't see any decelerations on this strip. And so variety is not applicable. So what category am I in? I'm in uh, category one. And my contraction pattern frequency is two and a half to four minutes. So here we're starting at this contraction, one, two, and here one, two, three, four. So two and a half to four minutes. And our duration is 70 to 80 seconds. Is any intervention needed in this strip? No, we don't need any intervention at this time. Moving on to the next strip. Again, pause that video. Go ahead and um, determine uh, your fetal monitoring um, interpretation and then continue on for the answers. Here are the answers. Again, we start with baseline and we're way up here, 195. Is that normal range? No, it is not. 110 to 160 is normal range. 
what is our variability? We are still looking at our variability and we are still at moderate variability. Are accelerations present? Yes, they are. Here's an axel, 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 axel. Are decelerations present? Yes, they are. If so, what kind are they? It looks like we're having some variable D cells here. And so our category is category two. This is really indeterminate. What is going on with this baby? A couple of things might be happening. The most common reason for a baby that has tachycardia is a maternal temp. And sometimes the baby will actually show that there's a temp before mom will show there's a temp. So cooling moderate measures should be enacted right away, including antipyretics um, and cooling measures like um, uh, uh, ice packs to the groin and to the axilla. We want to make sure um, that we're looking at our sepsis steps. We want to think potential sepsis, especially if the mother's heart rate is also accelerated, which it may be, or if there's other signs of infection like foul smelling fluid or um, her WBC count has risen. If contractions continue to be, so here we're looking at our contractions. So this contraction, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 seconds. What about this one? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 10, 20, 30, 40. So if these contractions continue to last this long, we need to start thinking about uterine resuscitation and making sure that we turn off any uterotonic. So if there's a Pitocin going on, um, we need to turn that off. Uh, this would also warrant uterine resuscitation. Let's get that mom cooled off, get the baby cooled down and um, let them recover and try to determine what's causing this baby to be tachycardic. The other potential is that this baby's stressed and it may not be from a temperature. So this could be a sign of stress and we need to pay attention to this baby because it's category two and that is our indeterminate and needs continue, continued monitoring. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna have you stop the video. Go ahead and take a look at this strip here. All right, let's go through baseline. We're looking here at our baseline. Where is it? Most of the time, most of the time it's 150. If you got 155, that's okay. You want to just pick a number. Um, you can't do a range there. You want to just pick a number. Is that normal range? Yes. And our variability, well, it's minimal to moderate. So you see, sometimes we have moderate, sometimes we have more minimal. So this is minimal to moderate. Are accelerations present? No, this one doesn't count. That's not 15 by 15. Are decelerations present? Yes. What kind are they? They appear to be variable. So what would be causing this? Potentially it could be um, uh, the cord. The, I mean, it is from the cord and, and it may be that the, the mom is laying on that baby's cord. Maybe there's low fluid. Maybe she's been ruptured for a while. The membranes have been broken for a while. Um, maybe the baby's reaching out. Maybe that cord is being pressed in between the baby's head and the pelvis. Lots of things could be happening here. So we definitely want to attempt position change. If this is happening more than 50% of the time, we're starting to get concerned. And we might even think about doing something like an amnio infusion. Of course, that would be with the provider's order. And that is a way for us to put some um, of that fluid back in to relieve the compression on the cord. Uh, looking at our contractions, two and a half to three minutes are the answers here, and duration 80 to 90 seconds. And is any intervention needed? Possibly. So I would start with uterine resuscitation, start with um, uh, some fluid resuscitation, and uh, uh, getting the mom turning to see if this relieves this. On to the next strip. Go ahead and pause that video. Here we are, looking at our baseline, 125. Is that normal range? Yes, it is. What is our variability? We're looking here. How much of a beat to beat change do we have in this variability? Absent, this baby is in trouble and is telling us. And then what's happening here? Do we have accelerations? No. Do we have decelerations? Yes. So here is the contraction and here's the start of that deceleration. So we're going to call this a late. Here's one, another late as it goes off the page here. And so we have a category three strip. Is intervention needed? Absolutely. 
Absent variability and late decelerations are consistent with fetal hypoxia, which can lead to acidosis, which can lead to uh, long-term brain anoxia and injury. So if we're remote from delivery, this patient needs to be heading to, uh, and, and, and uterine resuscitation doesn't help, we need to remove all uterotonics and prepare for cesarean. Next strip, go ahead and pause that video. Here are your answers. We're looking at our baseline, and I have 130 for the baseline here. Is that normal range? Yes. What's our variability? Moderate. Our accelerations present? They are. And our decelerations present? They are. And what's happening here? This deceleration is mirroring this contraction. This deceleration is mirroring this contraction. This deceleration is mirroring this contraction. So this is telling me that this is an early deceleration caused by head compression and is intervention needed? Possibly. We need to assess if, if delivery is imminent. So this would be a nurse at the bedside trying to determine when, where our baby is and if we're ready for delivery. And then consider position changes if she is still um, remote from delivery. If you have any questions, you're welcome to contact me. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation.